And Merry Christmas, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody good? All right, so the five people that just responded, thank you. How about the people back there? How are y'all doing? Everybody good? All right, there you go. Man, are y'all still recovering from yesterday? Is that what it is? Is everybody still kind of recovering? Yes. You know what I'm talking about. Like, don't over-spiritualize this. Like, Christmas is an amazing time of the year, but I'm telling you, it is like, go, go, go. Am I, am I right? Yes. Okay. I'm glad we all agree. Hey, if you guys have a, your copy of God's Word, Revelation 19 is where we're going to be at tonight, today. So uh, Revelation 19, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 21. Now, uh, normally we'll, we'll read, we'll stand up, we'll read a passage of scripture and, and then we'll go into it. But uh, today I'm going to just open us up in prayer. And so if you guys will, um, as you're joining me in Revelation uh, 19, if you don't know where that's at, last book of the Bible, last couple pages of the Bible. And, uh, and so uh, find that, and then we'll, uh, we'll kick this thing off in verse 11, and we'll go through 21. So Revelation 19, verse 11. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's pray together, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for this day. What an opportunity it is to gather together. Father, we thank you for what Christmas is truly all about. And uh, Lord, we, we're thankful that the Savior, that you, Lord, are still active and alive. And what we're going to see today is, is that you are coming again. You are coming back. And that is the day that we look forward to with anticipation for us that know you. And so, Father, I pray today that, um, that your, your word would, would light a fire in us today. And it would challenge us as we get ready to go into next year, the new year, 2022, that we would go uh, striving to live for you and draw closer to you than we've ever been. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Richard Baxter was a well-known Puritan pastor in England during the 1600s. And uh, he's considered to be a hero of the faith. And in fact, I've been greatly encouraged by his, uh, his writings, particularly on prayer, um, Puritan prayers are some of the most well-known prayers that you could ever read, and uh, Richard Baxter uh, has a lot of those that you can go and check out. But pa uh, Baxter was really passionate about evangelism, uh, very passionate about discipleship, and in fact, he is credited and, and most known for discipling his entire hometown of over 2,000 people that he pastored and ministered to. And all he did was go door to door, telling them about Christ and teaching them about Christ. And, uh, and, but even though he did fantastic work for the Lord, he was actually plagued by a lot of suffering. He had much pain and suffering in his life. He suffered from chron or chronically from kidney stones, headaches, bleeding, toothaches, swollen feet, and many other ailments, yet he pressed through all that pain for the sake of Christ. So one day someone asked him about that. They said, you know, uh, Baxter, what, what, is your, what, what keeps you so motivated? And Baxter's response was classic. He said, I think about heaven for at least 30 minutes a day. I reflect on heaven or I think about heaven for 30 minutes a day. Well, I believe it's safe to say that, that Richard Baxter lived a life of great anticipation. If he was setting aside time to think about heaven for 30 minutes a day, he anticipated what life would be like beyond this world. He understood that this world was only temporary. And that motivated him to live out his faith and remain focused on the mission. And so this Christmas season, we've been doing this study, and we're wrapping it up today, called The Coming King, where we've been looking at different aspects of our coming king and, and, our, and our response to that in light of that coming. And so this morning, we're going to continue this thought, but still, rather than focusing on the typical Christmas coming of our king, I want us to look ahead at the ultimate return of our king and what I would like to call and others have called the apocalyptic Christmas story. And so the reality is, is that we live in a time where we anticipate everything. We, we've talked about that. Pastor Jeff talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, as we move on for Christmas, we anticipate New Year's. As we move from New Year's, like that song Danny just sang, we look for the Super Bowl. If you're me, you're a NASCAR fanatic, you're looking forward to that kicking off in February, all right? Nobody else. Okay, cool. <laughs> so Brittany's excited. But anyway, but we anticipate things. We move on to the next thing. We're always focusing on the next thing. And we spend time, as Pastor just said, we spend time moving from one event to the next. It's an endless cycle. It goes over and over and over again. We just kind of live our lives in between various seasons. Well, today, I want us to be reminded of a, one particular event that we must not overlook. And as we just celebrated the coming of our king in a manger, one day we will celebrate our king coming through the clouds and on a white horse in ultimate victory. And, and I fear that many of us today neglect his second coming. 
And unfortunately, I think believers even overlook it, and they live their lives in a way that's contradictory to his word. Pastor Eugene Patterson once said it this way. He said, many in our world today think the same way about Jesus Christ, that he's simply a household utensil, that he was a wise and ethical sage or a meek and mild servant. Many do not take him seriously. Even Christians can be lulled to sleep by the spirit of this age, and we can neglect the power, beauty, and glory of our great God and Savior. And he says that Revelation 19 is intended to magnify Christ in our eyes, and John means to astonish his readers with the, majest, the, his, with the majesty and the authority of Jesus. And this text can act as smelling salts to awaken us from spiritual drowsiness. And so my hope is, is that we'll often think about his return. Maybe not necessarily 30 minutes a day, although that would be a great thing to do, but that we will reflect on it. And while we wait on our coming king, let's truly worship him with our lives because the, the reality is, is that the king will return yes. and all will see him as Lord. Right. And so really there's, there's three things in this text that I want us to really focus on. Then I'm going to finish with one final point of application. And, and here's the three things on the front end. Number one, the king will return in power and glory. Number two, the king will return with purpose. Number three, the king will return in victory. And then finally, until the king returns, we worship. So, because the king will return and we'll all see him at Lord. So let's look at Revelation 19. Let's start with the king will return in power and glory. And so let's, let's read verses uh, 11 through 16 in Revelation 19. Here's what it says. This is John writing as he's thrusted into a vision. He says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and his many crowns were on his head. And he had a name written that no one knows except himself. And he wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So get this vision that John's in. The heavens open up. He's looking up. The clouds just kind of split open. And then John begins, the Apostle John begins to give a detailed description of our king making his glorious return. And the first thing that he says is, is that he's riding in on a white horse. And so you can kind of get the picture of a general leading his troops into battle. However, as we'll see, this will not be a battle that lasts very long. But the white horse that he's coming and he's riding on symbolizes his victory and that he's pure. Victory and purity. But not only do we see him coming as a victorious lord and a pure king on a horse, John adds a bunch of descriptive names that we're going to walk through very, very quickly. Here's the first one. He's faithful and true. He's called faithful and true. And so unlike the, the rulers that we see in this world today, politicians, kings, or whoever it may be that's in a position of worldly authority, Jesus is faithful and true. Jesus is dependable. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. And this is what it means. The fact that he's true means that he's authentic and genuine. Now you look at the world leaders today, this is a striking difference of what we see. When people run for political office, it's easy to find that they flip-flop their opinions on everything, right? Because it's all about getting the most votes that you can get. And even if they promise one thing when they run, it doesn't necessarily mean that's what they're going to do when they get there. So they flip-flop their opinions. However, Jesus doesn't do this. He's faithful and true. And so what he says, you can believe. And when he acts, you can also trust him. And this is a significant encouragement for us, but it would also would have been a considerable, considerable encouragement for the, those who were reading John's letter, the intended people that, that he was writing to in this particular context. And because they, he was writing to a group of people who were sitting underneath a horrible ruler named Domitian. He was very unfaithful, particularly to believers. He was, he was awfully um, considered a liar and just kind of did whatever he wanted to do to bring himself his own glory and power. But he couldn't be trusted. However, we see here that Jesus can truly be trusted. Why? Because he's faithful and true. What he says is true. And because he's faithful and true, John goes on to say that with justice, he judges and makes war. And so the point that he's giving here is, is that Jesus comes and judges the world, and he's doing so in a fair and righteous manner. So therefore, his judgments can also be trusted. But see, John doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He says his eyes are like a fiery flame. So what is he talking about there? Well, not only is he faithful and true, but his eyes are a fiery flame. So that seems kind of odd. Like this is Jesus coming in, his eyes, fiery flame, like that's kind of creepy. So this image is used to show how deep his judgments can actually penetrate. 
See, Jesus knows everything. Jesus sees everything. There's nothing that we can hide from him. He penetrates deep into our souls. He knows us better than really we know ourselves. We like to tell ourselves that maybe he doesn't, but he does. And on one hand, that should encourage us, right? It should encourage us because the fact that Jesus knows us personally, and this personally should be an encouragement. However, on the other hand, that should terrify us. Why should it terrify us? Well, I don't know about you, but I mean, there's some things in my life that I don't necessarily just kind of want waving out for people to know, right? I mean, I don't know. Nothing that bad, I promise. But the point is, is like you, you, there's things that you don't want to throw out there. Jesus sees through that all. You may be hiding something from a spouse. You may be hiding something from a family member. You may be hiding something from a parent. You may think you're getting away with it because you're hiding it. Jesus sees it. Jesus sees past everything. He sees our hearts. He knows our thoughts. And he also knows how sinful and wicked we are. But even as he sees this, he loves us and he extends his grace and mercy to us. Just as deep as his judgments penetrate, his mercy and grace penetrates just as deep. For those who believe in him, he extends that to them. And that's what a God we serve. This, this text, uh, uh, John Piper once said, this is how the Bible is supposed to end. When you read particularly Revelation 19 through 21, it is so encouraging for those of us who are believers. We can take the worst possible version of ourselves and know that Jesus still loves us. When we can't forgive ourselves, he forgives us. But John keeps going says he has many crowns on his head, and so this points to his absolute sovereignty. Jesus is genuinely sovereign, meaning that he is the true king. We talked about this as we went through the book of Daniel a couple of last month. We finished it up, and one of the things that we noticed was that kingdoms and rulers, they come and go, but our coming king is the true king who rules forever and for eternity. But John keeps going again. He has no name that no one knows but himself. What does that mean? Well, there's much debate to, to what that is because obviously we don't know it because he only knows it, right? The, but here's kind of one, one commentator put it this way. He said that the human mind cannot grasp the depths of his being. So no matter how much we try to study and comprehend Christ, we'll never come to a complete understanding. And I would even go as far as to say that even when we're with him in heaven, we're not going to have a complete understanding unless he chooses to reveal that to us. We will only know what Christ reveals to us. And then John says that his robe is stained with blood. Some people believe that the blood represents the ones that are, that are killed due to not following the ways of the Lord, not taking the mark of the beast. That it, it could represent that. But on the other hand, maybe it's the blood of those um, who, uh, who, who were, were killed as a result of persecution outside of taking the mark of the beast. I, I, we don't really know. As, but one person once said, maybe perhaps it's God's intention to remind us that his enemies will be judged and the saints will be vindicated. And his redemption of the lamb will be remembered for all of eternity. I mean, the reality is, is we don't know this interpretation. We're not 100% sure of this interpretation, but there's one thing that we always need to remember. And it's this. The only way we're given access to the Father is through the blood of his Son who was shed for us. And so let us not overlook that. So regardless of what that blood on his robe means, Christ shed his blood for us. Let's let it represent that. Finally, we see here that his name is the word of God. And so basically, we know, because his name is the word of God, when we are looking at Jesus face to face, when we noted uh, during our Christmas Eve service, a baby in a manger, we can know that we are looking directly at the face of God himself. So when you talk to Jesus, you're talking to God. When you hear from Jesus, you're hearing from God. When you are in his word, you are hearing directly from our Lord. As Hebrews 1-2 puts it, it says, In the last days he has spoken to us by his Son, and God appointed him heir of all things, and made the universe through him. Church, how awesome is it that we are allowed to come into a relationship, a personal relationship with this Lord, Amen. the King who is coming, the one that's faithful and true. The one true God who's all-knowing. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And even though we're sinful and we're messed up, he still loves us. He's so great and majestic that we'll never be able to comprehend who he fully is. Yet we have the opportunity to draw near to him. This is the king that's coming. This is the king that we need to remember that is coming. 
And this is who we as believers wait for with much anticipation. As John closes out the book of Revelation in Revelation 22:20, 20, he says, come Lord Jesus, come. But John doesn't stop there. Not only does he give us many descriptions of, of the coming king, he also gives us another picture of the coming king in verse 14. He says, the armies that were in heaven followed him on a white horse or white horses wearing pure white linen. And so when Jesus comes, he will come with an army. And now again, there's much debate here as to who these people are. Some people believe that it's an army of angels. Others believe that uh, it's maybe believers. Some uh, believe that it could be raptured believers, depending on where you go there. I, I go with a combination maybe of the two. But however, what I want us to notice here is that when he comes with his army, notice that his army follows him. He's out front. He's leading the charge. One commentator put it this way. When we return with Christ, we, he will be out front. Not we. He will be out front. He will lead the way. We will not be participators in the battle, only spectators. King Jesus did not need our assistance to help when he came the first time to redeem sinners, and he will not need our assistance or help when he comes the second time to reign as sovereign. Holy armies will come with him, and they are following him, and he fights the battle for us. And here again wins the day on behalf of those who love and trust him. And so church, this is a good moment to pause and ask the question. Are we letting go and allowing Jesus to fight our battles in this life? One of the things that we have to realize as we wait for the coming king, again, this is kind of worship while we're waiting part two of what we started last week. But one of the things that we have to remember, one of the things that we have to realize, one of the things that we've got to come to grips with is that every day that we wake up as believers, we enter into a spiritual battle. Every single day. We're in this spiritual battle. And I think we often fail because we try to fight these battles on our own. And however, the battle's not really ours to fight. We surrender to Jesus and we let him take care of the rest. Our job is to remain focused on him, regardless of the circumstance. Focus on him regardless of how bad the situation gets. We keep our trust in him and we trust that he has it under control. See, we don't enter this spiritual battle fighting for victory. We fight from victory because the battle's already been won. And I think oftentimes believers, particularly us, and I put myself in this same camp, is that we try to m maneuver as if we have to win this. Like we have to move forward. No, Jesus has already done it. Jesus has already taken care of it. We just have to trust him. He's already won the battle. And we get to Revelation 15 and 16. He says, A sharp sword came from his mouth, so that he may strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod, and he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, Jesus had a tattoo. I don't have any. I, I, don't, I just it wouldn't look good on me. But if you've got one, there you go. All right? So there's three more images that we see here. Three more images. Then we'll move on to the next part. First of all, there's this sword that comes from his mouth. Well, this is the same sword, if you go back and look at Revelation 1.16, that showed his power and authority to judge and conquer his enemies in the future. Well, this is the future. This is what that's pointing to. The future is now. So a sword from his mouth will strike with authority and judge and conquer his enemies. Then we see this iron rod. And so this was something that a shepherd would use to control his flock and kind of get them in, to go in the, the right way. And so likewise, Jesus is going to overpower evil, and he will rule them and control the nations as one true king. And then we see this other image that's a little odd, trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God. In Revelation 14, if you were to go back there and read through that, you get this horrifying image of grapes being crushed, just as grapes are being crushed in a wine press. So you're making grapes, you crush them down, right? Because that's how you get the juice and all that kind of stuff. So you keep crushing them and crushing them, and then it comes out. Well, there's this image that this is the wrath of God being poured out on those who reject him. And so this wine press is basically the image of literally blood flowing through, and the grape juice is, or the wine is to represent the blood of those who reject him when he comes to judge. And it's a really graphic picture, but we see that Jesus will come and execute that judgment. 
And he can do this because he has the authority of God. And we know that, he, that this authority that he has because he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. And so when we, what, what a picture that we have here. Like our king is coming one day to judge the wicked and provide salvation to the faithful already found who, who have salvation in him. So again, the question is that we arrive at one more time is, is have you placed your trust in him? What, what more is it going to take? Uh, how, how much more pushing on our own are we going to go through? Because the one who's faithful and true the one who is righteous in his judgment, the one who's all-powerful and all-knowing, that one is going to stand in victory at the end of this world, and everything else will be defeated. And that includes those who do not trust him, who don't place his trust in him. Jesus will have the final word in this world. And so as bad as it may get, stock market stuff going crazy, leaders being elected to rule that we may not agree with or maybe we do agree with or whatever it might be the pain that as we see in america as america continues to i think drift and drift further away from a biblical worldview as difficult as that can be to go to work and try to witness and talk to other people about jesus when you feel like no one wants to hear about it jesus will win Jesus will have the final word. Our job is just to be faithful, to stay focused. So we see that this king, our king, will return in power and glory, but we also see that he's going to return with purpose. These sections are a lot shorter. The king will return with purpose. Look at verse 17. He said, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he called out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying high overhead, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the king's the flesh of military commanders, and the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of the horses and of their riders, the flesh of everyone, both free, slave, small, and great. It's a little weird, right? What in the world are we talking about eating the flesh of people? We don't do that. You're right, we don't. John Piper puts it this way, kind of illustrates it pretty well. He says, when the world is ready for judgment as roadkill is for the vultures, then he'll come in great wrath. This will not be private, secret, or pleasant for unbelievers, but he will come on the clouds of heaven with power and glory, and the judgment will be like the vulture sweeping on the corpse of human rebellion. And so what we see here is this is where we as believers are called to celebrate with the victory of God with him in heaven. Actually, in these verses right before, there's a big celebration that's going on in heaven. Right before John gives us this vision in verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 10, leading up into this text, it's a celebration of victory with believers. And then we get this vision. But we see here that there is a very different feast, and there is a very different fate for those who do not believe in him. There is a strong judgment that is coming for unbelievers. They will be feasted on by the wrath of God, just as vultures pick a clean animal that's dead. They pick them clean. And so there's coming a day when Jesus will come. All will be held accountable for their rejection of him. This will be a worldwide event where no one will be able to escape. Church, I ask the question again, if you don't have your faith and trust in him, how much more of an image do you need more than vultures picking a road-killed animal clean? It is not going to be a pleasant day for those who do not know him. It is not going to be a pleasant day for those who don't know, but it is an awesome day for those of us that do. There's two different feasts. Which one are we going to? So he's going to return with power and glory, and then the king's going to return with purpose, and then finally we're going to see that he's going to return victorious. Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21. Here's what it says. It says, Then I saw the beasts of the king of the earth and all their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence, he deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So we get the picture that you have the Antichrist over here on one side, and then you have Jesus and his army on the other side. It's about to go down. You think that there's going to be this ultimate battle that takes place between Jesus and the evil rulers of this world. But look at what happens between verses 19 and 20. It skips the battle, and then it goes straight to the defeat of the Antichrist. Why? Because the war was over before it began. 
Pastor Jeff noted that at the beginning of this series. In Genesis, the war was already over whenever it began in Genesis. Right after the fall, it was already over. All this led to a battle. We expect to see this huge, giant conflict, but it's not there. However, it happened so quickly that it's almost as if it never happened. But trust me, church, it happens. And this beast was captured along with the false prophet, and they're thrown into the lake of fire. Talk about an epic victory. Jesus shows up, game over. And just like that, it's over. Remember, the battle is not fought for victory, it's fought from victory. When we fight our battles in this life, we can trust and know that Christ has already won them. So the deception is addressed and they're sentenced into the lake of fire. And then, just as a judge gives a verdict, Jesus steps in and delivers the final judgment in verse 21. Satan's defeated once and for all. And then it says, The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds ate their fill of their flesh. And so, again, we have one more reminder about the judgment to those who reject him. They're killed by the sword that comes from Christ out of his mouth. And it's a vivid image, again, of birds feasting on dead bodies. That is not what you got all dressed up for to hear. But it's the reality for those who reject him. See, a lot of times we like to focus on the coming of our king, the savior that's in a manger. And we kind of forget about the coming of our king who's going to ride in on a white horse. So this section of scripture gives us a beautiful picture of our coming king. This is our king who's coming. This is the one who's going to rule for all of eternity. This is the king that welcomes us into his presence by simply putting our faith in him and trusting him. So the question is, is what do we do in the meantime? It's kind of that final section. Until the king returns, what do we do? Well, we worship him. We worship him. Billy Graham was once asked a similar question. This person came up and they they said, uh, Dr. Graham, I I know that I'm supposed to look forward to Jesus' second coming. But to be honest, I, I don't know. I, they go on to say, I, I know I haven't done as much as I should have for God, I'd, and I'd be ashamed to, to have him come before I'm ready. And then the person said, is it a mistake for me to feel like this? Well, Graham responded by saying, first, it is a mistake for you to feel like this, because Christ's second coming, as we just noted, will be a blessing, a time of blessing and joy for those who know him, ushered in to his presence. But as we wait for his return, and that's the, the, true, the true thing about it is that it is joyful, and we wait for his return, we do so with great anticipation as believers. Why? Not in fear, but we do it because we know that we are going to be with him for all of eternity forever. There's nothing sweeter than that. We'll be made new when he makes his glorious return. I love how Matthew 25, 34 puts it. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the prepared for you from the time of the foundation of the world. So Graham goes on to explain that there's really two truths that you need to keep in mind. First, no matter how far we fall short, remember that our salvation does not depend on our good works. Our salvation depends only on Christ and what he did for us through his death and resurrection. That's the only thing it hinges on. We cannot do anything to earn our spot into heaven. Jesus did everything for us to give us that opportunity. Second, God has a reason for keeping you here. This was the second, his second response. Life is short. And he said, if you're ever going to start living for Christ, it should be now. And so we see here, there's two responses as we wait. First, we commit to Christ and we surrender to him as Lord over our lives. And if we've seen anything here today, we see that those who follow after Jesus will stand in victory with him, ultimate victory with him. And so the question then goes, is have you repented of your sins and called him Lord. I know we ask that question a lot around here, but we ask it because it's a very much eternally weighted question. Have you trusted him? Have you repented and called him Lord because not calling him Lord, not, not necessarily because you're afraid of the wrath. I mean, passages like this in scripture can really scare you. That's why people don't really cover Revelation or like to teach through it because it's, it's a scary thing. But it's also a beautiful book. Because it's a great rewarding book for us as believers. It's the only book in the Bible that you're credited a blessing for reading it. And so, have you placed your trust in him? 
Not because of his, his, his wrath, you're scared of the wrath, it should terrify us, but because calling him Lord because of these attributes that we've already looked at, that he's faithful and true, that he's all-knowing, that he's all-powerful, he has all authority, the fact that, that he has chosen you to come to know him. He's knocking on the door of your heart. All you have to do is let go in your own humility and receive it. He's a risen Savior who extends his grace and mercy to us, not because we deserved it or because we've earned it, but instead simply because he loves us and he loves you. What a better Christmas gift. Nothing stands in comparison to him. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he is a king that wants to be in a relationship with you. And that's as simple as you coming to him and saying, you know what, God, I give up. I can't do this on my own. Come into my life. I trust you. Whatever that looks like for you. There's no prayer that can save you. We say that here all the time. But to just bow down and acknowledge him as Lord, that's all it takes. Repenting from your past mistakes and striving to be more like him each and every day. He wants you to live your life to the fullest for him and not waste it on chasing things this world has to offer. But secondly, it's number one, come to know him, but then it's our goal to live for him every day. Living for him every day in all that we do and everything that we say. And here at Aaron Lake Baptist Church, we believe that the key to living for him every day starts with a foundation in his word. We believe in getting into the word. We've been saying this all the time. We get into the word so the word can get into us. Some of y'all are like, I'm so tired of hearing that. Well, I'm the one that started saying that, and then Pastor Jeff started saying it, so get mad at him before you get mad at me, okay? I didn't tell him he had to say it to the church. I'm just saying. But we get into the Word so the Word can get into us. Why? Because God's Word is foundational for everything. How can we reflect and know His truths if we're not getting into it and actually learning them? How can we live Him out and strive to live for Him in our day-to-day if we're not actually taking the time to read what He's written? You know, it's funny, LifeWay Research did a recent study on discipleship, and it was a 10-year study, biggest study they've ever done on discipleship, and the two most important things they found first was that reading the Bible matters more than anything else. Yeah. Took a study to figure that out. And then secondly, the discipline of Bible engagement impacts every other spiritual discipline. So that includes prayer. That includes evangelism. That includes Bible reading, obviously. Spiritual intake. Those, dif- those, those disciplines that we look at. So you might say, well, Pastor Andrew, I know that reading the Bible is important. There's only a few problems that I have here. One, I'm too busy. You don't understand how busy my life is. Look, I understand. Adriel just had a blowout back in my office, which is why I was late coming in here, because I was helping Brittany clean it up. I get it. We're busy, right? That's why I didn't walk around, if y'all are wondering why I sat here, because I had to recollect my thoughts about what happened. She's going to watch that later and kill me. Okay. But I get it. We're, We're busy. And in some, like, I've read my Bible. I've tried to read my Bible. I just don't get a lot out of it. I don't understand how, to, how, do, I get, how do I get more out of the Word. Well, trust me, again, I'm with you. About five years ago, uh, I came across this um, reading and journaling plan that, that really helped me tremendously. And in fact, Pastor Jeff's going to talk about this here in a little bit. But we, uh, as we go into next year, we're going to really focus on two things um, as a church, church-wide thing. Um, one, all under the umbrella of discipleship, because we've been talking about that. Now we're going to start putting wheels to that. So um, when you come back in January next year, when you come back in January, we're going to do a series called This Is Us that's going to lay out some of those things that we're really going to focus on church-wide. But one of the main things that we're going to start in January is a church-wide Bible reading plan. And this reading plan is actually built um, for busy believers. It's five-day reading plan, a couple chapters a day, and you, it's a 260-day reading plan. And, and the reason why it's five days is because it gives you two days to catch up if you, don't, if you miss a day, right? So you can go back and do a catch-up. But So I started doing that reading plan, and it goes through the entire meta-narrative Scripture. Now, there's some things that, that, that aren't there, but it's, it, the, whole, the whole grand narrative of Scripture is there. You're reading through about 97% of the entire Bible. But one of the things that this, that this plan really did for me and it taught me was a, a method of Bible journaling that really helped me to engage more in Scripture. And this is all on our website already, by the way. It's on the front page of our website. It's called the F260 plan. You click on that. All these resources that I'm about to talk to are there. 
Church, I want to encourage you to get into the words of the work and get into us. Well, here's what's reading plan. It's called the HEAR method. And the reason why it's called the HEAR method is it stands for, uh, uh, it basically is, stands for highlight, explain, apply, and respond. And so what you do is, as you go through a reading plan, whether you follow our reading plan or whether you follow the, the, uh, your own reading plan, you go through the Bible, whatever you want to do, this is a good way to really focus in on, a thing, on, on some things. Because one, you highlight, first of all, what sticks out to you. And the highlighting is, is you select one verse that you know God might be speaking through to you. So you, you, you kind of just write that down. And then you explain, okay, what's going on in the chapter around it? Who's writing it? You know, why are they writing it? You know, if, if, if we're looking at Revelation 19, well, 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 John was in a vision from Christ, and, you know, and he was writing to encourage believers. This was written to believers. You know, so you just write down a few things. Explain kind of what's going on, just in a couple sentences. Who wrote it? What's happening? And then thirdly, application. That in a few sentences, write down exactly how those verses spoke to you. What's God, what's God, what do you think God's moving to you? How can you apply this into your life right now? And then as you respond, you really go and you, you, you write out basically a prayer. Lord, help me to, help me to, to live this out. God, help me to, to, to keep this in mind all throughout the day. And then you focus on that one thing as you go. Because a lot of times when we read the Bible, we read it and we get done with a chapter, we put it away, and then we don't touch it until the next day. Well, now here's a way to reflect on that a little bit more. And this plan, honestly, for me, I'm not up here trying to sell it at all, but for me, it, it revolutionized my time in the Word. Because I get it, it's hard sometimes. There's some things that are hard to understand. But it takes one or two points of application and you reflect on those areas rather than just reading and moving on. See, we're not going to accomplish anything when it comes to studying or reading the Word of God if we don't have a plan. And so really, we just want to encourage you to get into the Word. If you do this method, great. We've got those resources for you. We're going to give more resources. We're going to teach on this a little bit more. But if you've got your own reading plan, your own method, and it works great, then keep doing that. We're not trying to get you to change that. But we know what we know is that Bible engagement matters. And getting into the Word changes every aspect of our life. And unfortunately, most Christians today that are Bible-believing Christians hardly ever open the Bible. If God wrote a book, wouldn't you want to read it? Well, God did write a book, and we want to read it. And so we want to be a church that's transformed by that Word. And so I know what you're thinking. What does this have to do with waiting for the King to return? It has everything to do with waiting for the King to return. The king gave us a book that reveals to us the standard that he has given us to live by. And so shouldn't our goal of every believer to strive to be more like Christ than we were the day before? Amen. Church, we can't do that apart from his word. And if anybody wants to debate that, we'll set up a time and we'll talk about it. But we need to be students of the word. We need to get into the word so the word can get into us. That way our lives are transformed by his truths. And I'm afraid that a lot of times our lives are transformed by the truths of everything else that we hear rather than sitting down to hear from him. Amen. And so, church, I want to challenge you as we go into this next year. Again, if you go to b3church.org, all of what I just talked about is right there. That reading plan's there. The memory verses that go with it are there. We're going to have more discipleshipping and equipping resources coming up throughout the year to, to help in these areas. But we want to be a church that's about the word. But not only do we want to be about the word, we want to spread it. And it starts with us. And so the reading plan is called Foundation 260. And the reason why it's called Foundation 260 is because it's written to go through the Bible in a way that hits everything that a disciple of Christ should know. Most of every chapter of the Bible, all the chapters of the Bible are in there, but it doesn't necessarily go text by text all the way through, but it does hit every critical component. And so I'd encourage you to give that a shot if you don't have anything already. We want to live lives that are transformed by his truths, and we live that out until he returns. And so remember, our king is going to return in power and glory. Our king is going to return with purpose. He's going to return in victory, and until he returns, let us worship him. Let us grow in our knowledge of him through the reading of his word. Let us grow in, our, in, in how we reach out and live missionally to other people. Let's engage the lost world, because we know that the fate of those who don't know him is not good. Church, the king will return. All are going to see him as Lord. Amen. He's coming. Amen. The question is, are we ready? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. 
Father, I know that a message like this is not something you expect to hear the day after Christmas. But, Father, it's a message that's critical. The reality is, is you're coming again. You're coming. Whenever we least expect it, you're coming. Only you know that time. But, Father, I pray that as we wait on that return, Father, that we would not be caught not doing the work. And so, Father, I pray for us as a church that we would grow deeper in our knowledge of you from a standpoint of reading your word, but then take those truths and then apply them as we live out our life for you. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here that doesn't know you today, that they would come to know you. If anybody that's online, if they don't know you today, that they would come and just pray in their heart something along the lines of that they're a sinner, they're needed a Savior, and you are that Savior. And so, Father, I pray that they would place their trust in you in some way, shape, or form in that, in that way. It's a matter about putting our faith and trust in him and acknowledging our faults, our failures, and our sin, and then turning from that and falling into his arms. And so, Father, I pray that that would be the case today for somebody. Father, for those of us in the room that are believers, I pray that we would commit this next year in 2022 being a year that we truly get serious about living out our life for you, but also diving into your word, reading your word more, soaking in in the truths that you give us, reflecting on your faithfulness and your all-knowing power and just, Lord, who you are. Father, forgive us for taking it for granted. Father, you the coming King, give us an opportunity to know you through your word and to draw close to you. May we do that until you make your return. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.